Hello and welcome to this Nature.com custom webcast titled Precision Over Bulk Opportunities for Single Cell DNA Analysis in Oncology. My name is Jay Shan Carpen and I will be your moderator. Today's webcast is sponsored by Mission Bio. We'll begin today's webcast with presentations from three speakers Dr. Gerald Radich of the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center, Dr. Dennis Eastburn of Mission Bio, and Dr. Karichi Takahashi of the MD Anderson Cancer Center. We will then end with a Q&A session. To ask a question, just type it in where it says type your question here and then press submit at any point during the webcast and we'll answer them today. And now over to Gerald. Hi, I'm Jerry Radish of the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center. I'm gonna be talking today about single cell uh, genomics and how it may have some potential advantages in understanding the biology and the clinical utility of cancer. So I'm a, a translational biologist, mostly involved in the care of leukemia patients. And what my lab studies is what I call the three R's of cancer, response, resistance, and relapse. And so I study leukemia, but basically every cancer does something along the, these three lines I'm showing here. On the y-axis are the number of cells, on the x, time and what we're seeing here are the three potential responses to cancer therapy. The minority of patients have no response, that's the top red line, they're refractory to therapy. Obviously the line you want is the cure line, whereas the disease sort of dissolves when chemotherapy is given. But the lion's share of patients in all cancers first respond and then their disease comes back. And once their disease comes back, for most types of cancers, that is, signals your loss of chance of being cured. So the question is, why does this happen? Why do people initially show a response and then relapse? And how can we understand that by doing uh, genetic uh, testing with a bulk sequencing or with single cell sequencing? So our simplistic view of cancer in the past has been that a stem cell, a, in my case, a leukemic stem cell, undergoes a series of mutations. Each of these mutations confer a new uh, biological abnormality, and usually in leukemia, it takes three or more mutations to become a cancer. And our, our old thought was that you generate millions and millions of cells, in fact, billions of cells, that are actually genetically identical. So you have sort of a monolith of genetically similar cells um, that takes over as a cancer. Now, that single cell approach, that model, makes some sense if you look at the two uh, outliers of response. First, the sense of chemosensitivity, where your cancer goes away. If all of your cancer cells are genetically identical, but they all are sensitive to chemotherapy, then you can imagine uh, affecting a cure. On the other hand, if you have cancer that has billions of genetically identical cells and they're all of a resistant genotype, you get the refractory case. But what we're understanding now is that there are actually many, many clones in cancer. These are genetically related, but you can imagine sort of a family tree or a physical tree where you have a trunk of accumulation of mutations and then the tree divides where you get different branches having somewhat similar mutations, but then a number of novel mutations. Once you think about this, this allows you to think about cancer in a different way. Thinking about cancer as, in a sense, an ecosystem with different clones, some of which compete, uh, some of which may cooperate. Now, here's an example of uh, tumors having many clones. Uh, on the bottom, each line, vertical line, is a different patient population. And there are obviously a number of different types of solid tumors being represented there. And based on bulk sequencing data and the most frequent mutation, uh, you're looking at the relative frequency size of the founder clone, that is the initial population, which you're inferring from really the relative abundance of that mutation in the bulk sequencing. Then above that is for each of those patient samples, the number of additional clones. And you can foresee for some of the types of tumors, for instance, the thyroid tumor, there's a number of patients that have relatively small amount of clones, two or three in the green. But as you go into things like lung and melanoma, you have multiple, multiple clones in one patient. And that's important because then you can understand the response to therapy and the resistance to therapy as basically a Darwinian process where the sensitive clones are being eliminated by the tumor 
uh, and that basically gives space, both physical space and space for resources, to the more resistant clone. So this is an ex example of sort of a lineage tree of cancer on the left and Darwin's initial ideas about finch evolution on the right. So on the left, you can see that you have the kind of the stem with multiple different genetic related clones arising from that stem. And then on the right, you have Darwin's root diagram of the possible types of genetic evolution happening as finches. I love his little comment in the box there, I think, very modestly saying, yes, I think I have the best idea in several thousand years. So the idea of having multiple clones that have different potential functions really has many dramatic implications. We know that from this work that some of these clones have unique immunophenotypes, that is the antibody, or excuse me, antigen structure on the cell surfaces. If you grow out these clones, some of them will have different growth properties in vitro, some slower, some faster. And we know that translates into biases that we see in, in xenotransplantation models where the clones being able to engraft in the models are greatly skewed. So some clones will just grow much, much better in the xenotransplant uh, than the others. We know from several studies that some clones after selective pressure will contribute to the relapse, but we don't really understand the rules governing these behaviors, why some clones win and some clones will lose, and we don't understand you know, how to understand that in the context of therapy, because clearly what we do with most chemotherapy by applying great selective pressure over and over again is we allow cancer to use Darwinian selection in cancer's advantage. So we, I think in the future we need to think about cancer ecosystem, how we can try to think about cancer in a way that will allow Darwinian selection to be in the advantage of us curing cancer rather than the cancer becoming resistant. Here are some examples in leukemia, in acute myeloid leukemia, from Tim Lay's lab at the Washington University. And it shows that we have three different models of clearance of mutations. This is done by bulk sequencing. And you can see on the left, there's uh, examples where virtually all the different mutation clones disappear with therapy by day 30, and they remain gone. We have some where all the variants persist and decrease at day 30, but they don't go away. And in fact, once therapy is discontinued, these clones all rise back. And then we have the Darwinian selection model on the right, where some variants uh, go away, but there are some clones that persist. Again, just a, basically a battle of resistance and sensitive clones for the marrow space. This shows how some of these mutations either decrease or remain stable based on what kind of function they have, uh, initiating mutations, are less likely to be clear. Those are the top mutations, the DMT3A, TET2, IDH1. Uh, but mutations that are, that are secondary and cause great proliferation on the bottom panel, NPM1, FOT3, NRAS, they tend to actually uh, disappear with, with chemotherapy. So this is sort of a model then of, of how most patients react, where at chemotherapy 1, you might have a variety of clones represented by the red, green, and blue dots. After chemotherapy, the green and red remain, but then uh, are able to come up you know, given some selective advantage. You apply a new type of chemotherapy that eliminates the green competitors, but now the red remain who are highly resistant and uh, ultimately will uh, lead to resistance and the patient's demise. So one of the problems in, in trying to understand clonal selection in, is that when we do genetic analysis by bulk, we're really doing an averaging across all the clones. So it's very hard to understand what clones are actually there and in, in abundance. Uh, and the problem is with that is that there are many assumptions that are made in trying to, to dictate clonal or excuse me, infer clonal architecture from bulk sequencing. And one of them is that when clones are a different size, for instance, if you had an NRAS mutation with a variant allele frequency of 15%, and let's say an MPM1 with 50%, you might say, okay, those are different clones. And you may or may not be right in that assumption based on the, the actual sequencing mechanics. And the other assumption that's made is when those clones would be equal size, that they must be in the same clone. But we and others have shown that that is a greatly oversimplification. That really, if you really want to understand clonal dynamics, you really need to get down to the single cell level and look about what is going on cell by cell and then piece that together to the overall cancer ecosystem. 
And here's an example of a situation with the FOOT3 mutations in AML. What FOOT3 does in most of the cases is it happens to have an internal tandem duplication. That's showed in the top left JM domain, where a portion of anywhere from 30 to 300 base pairs will be duplicated and inserted in a, a head-to-tail fashion, creating a longer JM uh, domain. And you can see that if you PCR with consensus primers in the bottom panel, where you have the wild type uh, with the larger uh, different mutation. And then those are three samples where you can see the variation of the ITD size. So it's a fairly easy way to see this important mutation in AML. So one of our first examples of how single cell was important was a case where we found, in fact, in a AML samples that were enriched with BLAST, three different types of FOOT3 in the gel. We found a wild type mutation, we found a heterozygous with a fairly short ITD, and a heterozygous mutation with a fairly long ITD. Now, since these ITDs are activating, it didn't make any sense that there was actually two ITDs in the same patient. So what we did was PCR on single cells, and then what you're seeing here is a capital electrophoresis. And we found in these enriched blasts all five possible types of FLIC3 mutations. Wild type, homozygous, heterozygous with the long ITD, long ITD, homozygous, the heterozygous short ITD, and the short ITD by itself. So much more complexity than you would get just from looking at the bulk data. And this is an example of looking at both FOOT3 and the mutation NPM1. And the table on the right, to concentrate on table D, what we've done there is we've done bulk sequencing and determined the allelic frequency uh, by capillary electrophoresis, and then we've taken single cells, and by brute force, and this is the work of Amy Pergurgan, who did a Herculean work in this effort, taking s thousands of single cells and doing genotyping, and basically by that, reconstructing what you would get by the kind of aggregate bulk in both the F FOOT3 and the NPM1. So you can just see, for example, in patient one, when you looked at the bulk sequencing, you got a allelic ratio of 0.83, when you did all the single cells and counted the ones that were positive for the ITD and those that were wild type, and then averaged those all together, you get 0.075 in CU. So for all of these patients that you can see, the allelic frequencies by bulk and single cell were quite compatible, suggesting that what we were seeing was not just a mere artifact. So then you can actually, you can test the assumption that you actually have a single clone. And what you have here are diagrams of all of the genotype possibilities of wild type, heterozygous mutant, and homozygous mutant for both NPM1 and FOOT3 in several samples. The kind of wire diagram you see would be the frequency of these allelic types if you assume that it's one single clone. And then in the colors are the actual frequencies that we found in the population by doing single cell sequencing. And you can see these are quite different with p-values, which are likely believable by even most skeptics. Now, this is an example of, of what I th uh, we think is going on with relapse. And one of the things we have to realize is that relapse, in fact, may be dependent on the context of where it occurs during therapy. So on the top panel, you have the clinical view, which is someone who relapses during therapy. The next panel is someone who relapses a short while after therapy and then someone who relapses late after therapy. And then in the middle there, you have the molecular view. And basically, the first is really the survival of the fittest. We have multiple clones, which are responding to selective pressure, and the resistant clones then grow out and give you your relapse. The middle panel is what we call culling of the herd. That is, all of the, the mutation clone types are being suppressed identically, and then after therapy is eliminated, they all come back the same. Uh, this isn't really a selective pressure against any clone. It basically is that you haven't eliminated any of the clones. And this is an example where more therapy or more intensive therapy uh, may have been needed. And then on the far right, you have secondary disease where, in fact, you've actually eliminated the primary leukemic clones, but the actual chemotherapy that you've given has caused injuries to the stem cell, and you have a leukemia that was, in fact, and not closely related to the original leukemia at all. Now, if those three possibilities are really possible, I think you really have to think about the tools you need to study that. And, and it's clear that bulk itself 
is probably not necessarily good enough that you really need to dive deeper with something like single cell sequencing. So in summary, we can say that cancer is made up of many related but genetically and biologically distinct clones. Two responses often can be thought of as simple Darwinian selection. We need to learn how to use natural selection to our advantage instead of against us. And to do this, we really have to understand clonal structure and how it changes during therapy. Now, how we can accelerate understanding the, th the three R's, response, resistance, and relapse, is I think that it would be important to move away from bulk sequencing uh, and make single cell analysis routine. And I underline routine because we really uh, had a couple year hiatus in doing single cell work because I showed you the work that Amy did. It was spectacular work, but spectacularly hard and expensive because it was really brute force, single cell sorting by flow cytometry, and then genotyping. And when you do that, even though you're using small amounts of reagents, if you're doing that on a thousand cells, it gets expensive in a hurry, and it's also amazingly labor intensive. And if you didn't have someone who was kind of a technical, thoughtful uh, genius like Amy, you couldn't do it. The second point is that providing higher resolution of these clones will potentially be interesting in, in disease monitoring. And what I mean that by that is by um, not only looking after therapy for any remaining cells, for instance, by flow cytometry, but able to identify what those cells are genetically and then target therapy towards them. And then using technology that enables speed and accuracy at a reasonable cost, that goes to my first point, we have to be able to automate this to really to make progress. So this is what I was talking about with the selection. If you imagine that you sort of give wide arching chemotherapy initial on to basically kill off the sensitive clones, at the end, you may be able to actually go down and look and see what clones are remaining. And we have lots of targetable lesions now. At diagnosis, there are probably too many targetable lesions, but if you use kind of broad-based chemotherapy to exert a maximum selective pressure, you might be left in remission there with some cells that you could actually genotype find the mutations on the right, and then actually use targeted therapy at a point where there are few targets to go for. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dennis Eastburn to talk about some of the technical nuts and bolts of this technology. Thanks, Jerry. I think it was uh, quite clear from your presentation how tumor heterogeneity can fundamentally impact the progression of many cancers. I think it was also uh, quite clear that single cell analysis methods afford us a much higher resolution view of tumor heterogeneity and clonal architecture within tumor populations. And it's our belief that this you know, improved understanding of clonal architecture will ultimately lead to more informed therapy selection with precision medicines. So we in Mission Bio appreciate the challenges inherent in performing single cell DNA sequencing. And for this reason, we've introduced a novel technology to really uh, make that type of analysis much more routine and accessible. So our technology enables accurate SNP and indel calling at targeted genomic loci across up to 10,000 individual cells per sample run. And that level of throughput really affords us a, a very high sensitivity ability to go in and find rare subclonal populations that could critically impact tumor biology. So to make the workflow accessible to both researchers and clinicians, we've made uh, it purposefully simple, and that includes providing a bioinformatics pipeline and data visualization solution in the form of dedicated software. And something we've introduced recently that we're extremely excited about is the ability to take you know, custom targeted content and make that uh, compatible, basically put that on our genomics platform so that individual researchers can now target up to 300 unique genomic loci relevant to their particular application or research. So our uh, single cell DNA sequencing workflow fits seamlessly into existing NGS workflows that many labs are currently running. The workflow entails first taking a cell suspension or cell preparation of interest and then loading that onto our microfluidic cartridge where we perform our multi-step droplet workflow. You know, the end result of that multi-step droplet workflow is the incorporation of cell identifying molecular barcodes into amplicons across many different targeted genomic loci. And so once that barcode incorporation step has been performed, you know, you can basically break your emulsion and perform uh, your library prep 
uh, in bulk prior to sequencing with NGS. And then of course, once you have your NGS sequence data, uh, you can run that through our uh, data analysis pipeline and data visualization pipeline to analyze your tumor heterogeneity. So I'll take just a, a few moments to elaborate on these uh, the middle steps of the workflow that are performed uh, with our instrument. And I wanna do that because it's our novel droplet-based microfluidics that really differentiate uh, Mission Bio from other droplet-based workflows you may have heard of. And you know it's that workflow that really enables our capability when it comes to performing high throughput single cell DNA sequencing. So we first take cells of interest and then we microfluidically combine them with a lysis reagent um, that contains a protease. And so once we've generated a population of drops containing individual cells and this protease, um, the protease is able to not only very effectively lyse the individual cells, but it's able to digest you know, cellular proteins, including nuclear proteins such as histones, that would otherwise sequester genomic DNA and result in less efficient downstream molecular biology. But of course, you know, the use of a protease entails that we also have the ability to turn it off once it's performed its function. And so we actually do that uh, on a lab thermocycler, and it's a thermal inactivation step that we perform. And once that's occurred, we now have a, a population of droplets containing many individual cells, um, you know, one cell per droplet. Um, and those cells now are in the form of basically genomic DNA prepped lysate. And those drops can then be flowed into a second microfluidic device and combined with cell identifying molecular barcodes, PCR reagent, and gene specific primers. And you know, that, those individual droplets, the second population of droplets, can then be placed on a standard laboratory thermocycler where the barcodes, cell identifying barcodes, get incorporated into amplicons produced. Uh, from the targeted genomic loci. So you might ask why we've gone to the trouble of developing this multi-step droplet workflow. And, you know, the motivation behind it really came from uh, data we've seen, you know, even very early in the development of our technology uh, that demonstrated that there's a real advantage to using a protease when it comes to performing molecular biology reactions on genomic DNA. An example of that advantage is shown on this particular slide. On the right-hand portion of the slide, you see a histogram where we've plotted the percentage of barcodes on the y-axis, or percentage of cells, that's another way to think about it. Um, and then we've looked at the read coverage depth at eight different targeted genomic loci from one of our early development panels. And we've essentially run identical workflows here, one where we've incorporated the protease into the workflow and the other one, the red one, where we've omitted the protease from the workflow. And we've gone ahead and done our standard uh, barcoding uh, reactions and then followed by next-gen sequencing. And when you look at the percent of barcodes having 20x or higher coverage at each of these different loci, you can see that you know, the workflow with the protease has a real quantitative advantage when it comes to getting sufficient read coverage um, at these positions relative to the workflow where we've omitted the protease. And that's really fundamental to our ability to go in and accurately genotype at our targeted positions across thousands of single cells. So having developed the core technology, we really wanted to start to apply it to clinically interesting questions in oncology. And so we've worked with a number of collaborators at different institutions to apply our technology to the study of tumor heterogeneity. You know, this, is, uh, this slide has an example uh, data set from one single cell analysis exp experiment we did with a collaborator, but it you know, highlights a, a couple recurring things that we continue to see with our technology. The first is that we're able to identify rare subclones that could be critically important to tumor biology. And then the second sort of related feature that we often see when we use our platform is that we're able to not only identify those rare subclones, but we can tell what mutations specifically occur within those subclones. In, in other words, we're able to identify co-occurring mutations at the single cell or clonal level. And you know, that's an unambiguous identification of subclone genotype 
that's just not really possible with uh, standard next-gen sequencing where everything's done in bulk and you lose that single cell or clonal resolution. I wanted to end with a brief look at our targeted sequencing panel for applications in acute myeloid leukemia. The panel targets 19 genes commonly implicated in the acquisition or progression of AML. Panel performance was optimized in a number of key areas, including uniformity across amplicons, the percentage of on-target read mapping, and a minimized allele dropout rate. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to the last speaker in this webinar series, Dr. Koichi Takahashi from MD Anderson Cancer Center. Koichi has been using this panel together with the tapestry technology for high throughput single cell DNA sequencing to look at clonal heterogeneity in acute myeloid leukemia and to see how that heterogeneity changes through the course of the disease. Thank you. Hi, my name is Koichi Takahashi. I'm a physician scientist at MD Anderson Cancer Center. I was one of the lucky person who had an early access to the tapestry platform, and today I would like to share part of our experience using this platform in samples from real AML patients. Jerry has already given us an excellent overview of clonal evolution in cancer, so I will only provide a brief background here. But although 70% of AML patients can attain complete remission with induction chemotherapy, half of them eventually relapse. And as a physician treating these patients, this is a critical problem because relapse AML is more resistant to chemo and the outcome after the relapse is extremely poor. With the advent of the next-gen sequencing, we can now infer clonal architecture of AML samples fairly well by comparing the variant allele frequency of the mutations. And by tracing these variant allele frequency in sequential samples, we can also infer clonal evolution from the time of diagnosis to the relapse. However, inference of clonal architecture based on the data from bulk NGS stands on a lot of assumptions, and the interpretation could be confounded by many factors such as tumor purity and zygosity of the mutations. Plus, when two or more mutations are found, bulk NGS cannot clearly tell whether these mutations co-occur in the same cell or exist separately in a different cells. Since there is a potential that single-cell DNA sequencing can overcome some of these limitations, we work together with Mission Bio and analyze longitudinal bone marrow specimens from AML patients during their disease course. The study design is very simple and straightforward. We had cryopreserved bone marrow aspirates taken from AML patients at the time of diagnosis, remission, and at the time of relapse, and we run tapestry platform to analyze clonal evolution at single cell level. From two of the three patients, we did not have remission samples for analysis, so we analyzed baseline and relapse pairs. But in one patient, we were able to analyze three time points, baseline, remission, and relapse. This is a clinical history of the first patient we analyzed. He was a 66-year-old man with AML, having 80% myeloblast in the bone marrow, and had normal cytogenetics by chromosome analysis. He received induction chemotherapy with fludarabine, cytarabine, and idorubicin and achieved remission at day 28. He further received two more cycles of consolidation chemotherapy, but unfortunately relapsed three months later. We also run bulk NGS sequencing on the same longitudinal specimens, and we identify TP53, DNMT3A, and FLT3 mutation in these samples. Based on the bulk NGS sequencing, DNMT3A had the highest variant allele frequency at the baseline, followed by TP53 and FLT3. In the remission samples, FLT3 was eradicated, but TP53A and DNMT3 mutation persisted. And in relapse, these three mutations all came back with the similar variant allele frequency. So here we show the QC metrics from the tapestry run. We were able to genotype about 4,000 to 5,000 cells per run. And we also spiked in Raji cells in each run because this Raji cell carried a known heterozygous TP53 mutation. And based on that result, we can infer the allele dropout rate. 
the allele dropout rate turned out to be about 2.8% to 8.4%, which is relatively low for the single cell DNA sequencing platform. On the right, we show the variants that were detected by the tapestry platform. In total, we detected 17 variants, and four of them were non-synonymous variants. And three of them, which are DNMT3A, FLT3, and TP53, were the one that we detected from the bulk NGS sequencing. There was one ASXL1 variant we also detected, but this turned out to be a common SNP. So this was actually a germline polymorphism. Here we show how the output of the tapestry looks like. The chart on the left shows VAF of each variant in each single cell. As you can see, ASXL1 had 100% VAF in almost every cell, suggesting that this variant is a homozygous polymorphism. Using the standard genotype color, we converted these data into the heat map. Here, each row represents each single cell, and the color indicates whether the mutations were heterozygous or homozygous or wild type. In the baseline, we clearly saw a population that dominated the samples, which have all three mutations. But in addition to this, we also saw several population of cells carrying a variety of combination of mutations. Some cells carrying only DNMT3A and TP53, and the other cells carrying three mutations, but DNMT3A being homozygous. In remission samples, most of the cells were wild type, but we did detect 11 cells carrying mutations with either TP53 or DNMT3A. These probably represent MRD clones. What was surprising to us was that clonal architecture of baseline sample was essentially preserved at relapse. The cells with triple mutation and other subclones all came back at relapse with surprisingly the same distribution. So in this particular case, there was no change in terms of clonal heterogeneity or clonal architecture between diagnosis and relapse. We then compared the results of bulk sequencing and the single cell sequencing results. The pseudo bulk VAF estimated from single cell sequencing agreed well with the VAF from bulk sequencing. But clonal inference was different from bulk sequencing and single cell sequencing. In bulk sequencing, the nmt 3 a mutation had the highest variant allele frequency and therefore was considered as a founder mutation. However, based on the single cell data, TP53 mutations were found in more number of cells. I believe this discrepancy comes from the fact that there was a significant population of cells with homozygous DNMT3 mutation that raised the VAF of bulk sequencing. But at the cellular level, TP53 mutation was mutated in more number of cells. This discrepancy raises an interesting question because DMT3A affected more alleles while TP53A affected more cells. And which should be considered as founder mutation is an open question and this type of question can only be raised because of the power of single cell DNA sequencing. Nevertheless, the takeaway from this first case was that Tapestry was able to genotype roughly 5,000 cells in each run with relatively low allele dropout rate. It clearly identified a major clone carrying triple mutation in a single level. It also showed some potential of detecting MRD clone at remission samples. In this particular sample, we were also surprised by the fact that clonal heterogeneity in the architecture was well preserved at the baseline and relapse sample. After confirming the performance of the tapestry platform, we then move on to the second patient. This patient was 59-year-old female with AML, normal cytogenetics. She received induction chemotherapy with idorubicin and cytarabine. She again achieved remission at day 28. She then underwent for allogeneic stem cell transplant but unfortunately, 75 days after the transplant, she also relapsed. We also had a bulk NGS sequencing results from this patient, and we knew that this patient carried NPM1 
IDH2 and DNMT3A mutations. Here is the tapestry results for the second patient. The heat map on the left shows the clonal architecture at the diagnosis, and the heat map on the right shows the clonal architecture at the time of relapse. We again spiked in the Raj cells, so you can see that on the TP53 mutation results. This patient's clonal architecture was much simpler than the first case, where a large portion of cells carried triple mutation with IDH1, NPM1, and DNMT3A that were also confirmed by the bulk NGS sequencing. Still, DNMT3A mutation affected the largest number of cells followed by IDH1 and NPM1, and this likely represent the order of this mutation that happened during the leukemogenesis in this patient. Similar to the first case, this case also had grossly unchanged clonal architecture from baseline to relapse even though this patient underwent allogeneic stem cell transplant. Interestingly, in this case, we detected homozygous NPM1 mutation, which is also consistent with what Jerry found in his prior study. Let's move on to the third patient. So this patient was a 65-year-old man with AML, again with normal cytogenetics. He actually received low-intensity induction chemotherapy consisted of cladribine and low-dose cytarabine. He did achieve complete remission at day 28, but received multiple rounds of consolidation therapy for 18 cycles, in addition to 12 more cycles of the cytabine maintenance therapy, which totaled of 1.5 years of maintenance therapy. Unfortunately, he relapsed after three years and we also had bulk NGS sequencing results, which revealed NRAS mutation, IDH2, and ASXL1 mutation in this sample. Again, this is the output of tapestry platform for the third patient. Heat map on the left shows clonal architecture at diagnosis, and the right shows at the time of relapse. You will see Raji's cell spike in this sample too. At baseline, IDH2 mutations were found in most of the cells, followed by NRAS and ASXL1. This again represent the multi-step acquisition of the mutations during leukemogenesis. Interestingly, a minor subclone that carried triple mutations significantly expanded at relapse, suggesting that this subclone was selected during the consolidation and maintenance therapy and expanded at relapse. This pattern of clonal evolution was significantly different from the previous two patients where clonal architecture was largely preserved between diagnosis and relapse. This patient had much longer remission duration of three years and also received multiple rounds of consolidation and maintenance therapy. And whether this has something to do with this unique clonal evolution is an open question. To summarize our experience in using tapestry platform in three AML patient samples, this platform is feasible in genotyping primary AML patient samples, and we can genotype about 5,000 cells each run. There was a good concordance of mutation detection and varying allele frequency with the bulk sequencing and we are able to visualize marked clonal heterogeneity in AML samples and its evolution from the diagnosis to relapse. Single cell DNA sequencing add additional layers to the clonal heterogeneity, not only the variant LE frequency, but the co-occurrence and also the zygosity of the mutation. There's also a potential of this platform in detecting MRD signature. Based on these early experiences, we are very excited about the future application of this platform. The data from single cell sequencing bring up new open questions on clonal heterogeneity of AML. Does heterozygous mutation and homozygous mutation has biological or clinical differences? What are the major pattern of clonal evolution in AML? We need to analyze more cases to identify meaning pattern here. If the platform can genotype much larger number of cells, it certainly has a potential for MRD detection tool too. Based on the information from Mission Bio, 
the updated version of Tapestry can now genotype 10,000 cells per each run. This is promising from MRD perspective. I'm going to finish here with some analogy that represent the power of single cell sequencing. I live in Texas where, as you know, when you analyze as a bulk, it is clearly a red state. But what happened if you analyze Texas as a single cell? It actually turns out that there is a heterogeneity in Texas too. And this information is clearly important to win the election. And this is also true in the fight with AML. We need to better understand the heterogeneity of AML cells in order to win the battle against AML. And thank you for listening. And I will close here. And we are happy to answer questions from the audiences. Thank you for your presentation, Koichi, Dennis, and Jerry. Uh, it is now time for the Q&A with all three speakers. To answer a question, just type it in where it says type your question here and then press submit. And our first question, uh, and this one is for you, Jerry, and it asks, what is the clinical utility of single cell DNA analysis? Well, I think that's um, sort of to be determined in the future that what we have to do uh, first is understand uh, the added additional um, information that single cell analysis gives us on the complexity of the clonal structure. Uh, and I think uh, so it's, it starts as a research tool and then for clinical, I think it quickly, quickly morphs into um, really two major uh, arenas. Um, first, I would suspect that once we learn about the clinical heterogeneity at diagnosis, that that amount of heterogeneity will map to expected outcomes. Uh, so people who have many, many clones uh, will probably uh, need a more aggressive therapy. Uh, and, and moreover, there's probably going to be more targets uh, at diagnosis than targeted therapy can offer. Um, so following patients after they get treated and, and after chemotherapy eliminates some of these clones, we know how important minimal residual disease is in the predicting outcome, uh, but right now we just call cells as all positive. We don't know their, their, what mutations they have. This kind of technology would actually let us to look to see uh, not only what, how many cells are still persistent after chemotherapy, but who they are, and then target therapy uh, on the back end. So you can imagine sort of a natural selection sweep of many clones and the ones that are resistant, the ones that you need to do something different about, you can now characterize as to what those are. And I think that that would allow us to really kind of be a little bit smarter about targeted therapy. Um, it, it would also allow us to understand, um, you know, what combinations of mutations in cells behave differently. Because right now when we do the bulk averaging, uh, where we make a lot of mathematical assumptions about uh, which cells have which mutations uh, coordinately. Uh, but this kind of technology will actually allow us to allow, to understand the interactions of you know, specific genes in individual cells and how that impacts on treatment sensitivity. So I think I in the future it uh, has a has a huge um, impact on how we look at cancer and and how we um, essentially use Darwinian selection to our advantage as opposed to our disadvantage. Great, thanks, uh, Jerry. And our next question, uh, this one's uh, for you, Dennis, and it asks, uh, what tools does Tapestry have for data analysis? Yes, we realize that uh, you know, data analysis is really a key part of the overall uh, workflow. And uh, you know, it doesn't, doesn't do you much good to generate you know, so much single cell data if you, if you really don't have an efficient way to process it, uh, call variants, and then visualize uh, you know, the, the information you've learned about tumor heterogeneity. Um, so for that reason, we've developed a, you know, cloud-based solution that requires little to no bioinformatics experience to, to, uh, to, to run those software packages. And we avail uh, offer them uh, free of charge um, uh, to users of our tapestry system. Um, so the, the process basically first entails taking your FASTQ file from next-gen sequencing uh, uploading that into our data analysis pipeline where uh, single cell variants are called. Uh, once that's done, uh, you basically take a um, VCF file and you put it through our data visualization software 
where you can uh, look at the sub subclonal structure of different samples and compare uh, those samples to one another. Great. Thanks, Dennis. And our next question uh, is for you, uh, Koichi. Uh, and this one asks, um, is there a need for improved MRD assessment for AM, AML? Um, absolutely. Um, currently, we use flow cytometry-based MRD assessment in the clinic, which can suffer from a lot of um, inter-observer variance and um, needs a very well-trained pathologist who interpret those data. So actually, although we do it in our center, it is not um, commonly done in a lot of community um, centers. So the, now the field is moving to uh, next-gen sequencing-based MRD assessment, which uh, Jerry also um, went over some data uh, based on the JAMA paper from um, Tim Lay. But um, there's a clear evidence that um, residual mutations, um, especially in the leukemia-specific mutations, um, if it's uh, persistent at the remission, it confer the poor prognosis. Um, now, I guess uh, FIO is also waiting for the single-cell-based MRD assessment, uh, which Mission Bios, uh, this tapestry platform, has some potential um, for that. So, uh, in summary, um, MRD, um, is definitely important field. Um, it has multiple studies have shown the um, prognostic impact of MRD assessment, uh, either by flow and next gen sequencing. And I think uh, there is also a um, pro prom promise in the single cell platform to be in this field. Great. Thank you, Koichi. Um, and our next question um, is for you, Dennis. Uh, and this one asks, um, for the uh, cell suspension used for your single cell um, seq uh, workflow, uh, have you isolated single cells from a suspension derived from frozen solid tumor cells, uh, or uh, only cells sus um, suspensions uh, from fresh tissues or cell cultures? Uh, yes, we've run a, a variety of sample types through the tapestry platform. Um, we routinely run uh, bone marrow aspirates, um, PBMCs, uh, cell lines, and fact-sorted cells uh, through the workflow. And we've recently started to uh, disaggregate uh, solid tumor tissue and run those cells through the workflow as well. And we've also developed uh, protocols for isolating nuclei from fresh frozen tissue and then running them through the workflow uh, to get single cell DNA seq data. So the tapestry platform is, is generally compatible with a you know, really wide range of cell types, including solid uh, tumor tissue. Great, thanks Dennis. And our next question asks, uh, in the um, bioinformatic pipeline uh, after the sample process, uh, usually there is a serious problem merging different experiments carried out um, at different times. Um, how do you deal with this? Um, Dennis, is that something that you, perhaps you can answer? Uh, yeah, I'd be happy to answer that. Um, yeah, we've given that a lot of thought, and you know, we've uh, looked at um, longitudinal sample sets uh, from AML pa uh, cancer patients. Um, so in that context, it's really important to sort of be able to compare the samples as the you know, uh, disease progresses. So we've built that analysis capability into our uh, software package so you can you know, directly compare, let's say, diagnosis and relapse samples and look at how the clonal populations uh, evolve and change uh, through the course of the disease. Great. Thanks, Dennis. And our next question asks, um, is the uh, new ecosystem theory uh, a way to confirm the Darwinian evolution uh, relapse of a malignancy? Um, Koichi, is that something that you can answer? Um, I'm not sure if I understood the question very well. Um, um, maybe Jerry. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I think a whack at. So, so you know what what we see in in virtually all types of cancers is, um, you know, the the rule of thumb is whatever your length of response is, uh, if you relapse, your your next response is going to be about half of that, and and. The, the number of patients who will get a complete response is about half. So if, for instance, AML, if we um, 
get 80% of people in a complete response and the median duration of that response is a year, we can typically, the chance of, once people relapse, the chance of you getting a response is about 40% and usually, you know, your, your response is about half of that, so, right? So you're basically getting selection for more and more resistant clones. And I, and I think that really is, there's, I think, more and more evidence that that's, you know, some Darwinian selection. But um, once we can understand that, then we really get, the fun really begins, right? Because in, in most ecosystems, there are uh, clones that, co uh, that uh, compete against each other. But there's also clones that cooperate with each other, right? So, so it may well be that we don't need to cure cancer by killing every last cell. It may well be that we selectively uh, wipe out the clones that are actually going to hurt you and let the clones that are growing so slow that they'll just take up space uh, that the other clones might like, um, you know, and basically start using evolution to our benefit. But we really can't get there, you know, until we start having this kind of tool to actually be able to uh, look at the clones at a, at a much more, um, you know, deep, much deeper in the weeds. Excellent. That was Thanks, my, Jerry. That was my crack at it. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. I'm sure that's uh, answered the, the, the question perfectly. Uh, brilliant. Um, our next question uh, is for you, Dennis. Uh, and this one asks, um, does the uh, mission bio uh, workflow involve two different uh, instruments uh, for droplet formation, uh, one to combine cell and protease uh, and another for lysate, barcode and reagents, or are both on a single instrument? And sort of following on from that, um, do customers need to physically transfer from droplet instrument to thermocycler, uh, or is the thermocycler on board as well? Yeah, so we, we offer a single instrument. Um, it's about a cubic foot, so it's, it's relatively compact in size. Um, that instrument runs a single cartridge, which, which performs both steps of our two-step workflow. Um, so no, it's a single instrument, and then once the uh, final PCR emulsion is generated, uh, that is, you know, collected into uh, a strip, uh, eight strip uh, PCR tubes, and then transferred directly to just any standard laboratory thermocycler for the barcode incorporation and uh, genomic amplification. Excellent. Thanks, Dennis. And uh, our next question asks, um, is this technology also applicable to cells obtained with a biopsy from a solid tumor? Um, Dennis, is that something that you can also answer as well? Uh, yeah, I, I think I uh, mostly addressed this one previously. Uh, yes, we have enabled uh, the ability to do uh, solid tumor disaggregation and then analysis on the, the workflow. And again, uh, we can also isolate nuclei and do genotyping off those uh, nuclei prepped from solid tissue. Great. Thanks, Dennis. And our next question, uh, I think, is for you, uh, Koichi. Uh, and this one asks, um, Understanding TX as a heterogeneous state is great, uh, but it doesn't decide national policy. Um, this is largely decided based on the cumulative uh, readiness um, or blueness of TX. Um, can you comment on the value of single cell versus bulk sequencing uh, when applied to, to, to a large sample set? <laughs> yes, um absolutely. Um yeah, well we we are definitely <laughs> we're definitely um excited to expand the cohort uh using this platform. And first thing we I want to know is uh this clonal heterogeneity um how many um how what what rate of AML sample has extreme clonal heterogeneity? Um for example in the three cases we already did uh Two of them had a very simple um, clonal architecture, while one case had extremely um, complicated clonal heterogeneity. Whether having these complex clonal heterogeneity at the single cell level, whether that is related to any uh, treatment failure or the long-term survival, that's uh, one question that we really want to um, ask and get an answer for. Uh, the other question um, where the single cell actually has a power is this um, comparison between the baseline and the relapse clonal architecture, it, this uh, these platform can clearly um, tell us what shift was there uh, between the diagnosis and relapse and whether that is related to certain treatment exposure or certain 
way of giving the treatment, and those kind of um, questions cannot be answered clearly by the bulk sequencing, although can be inferred by some uh, from the bulk sequencing. So I think the single cell really has power to clearly, clearly visualize these um, questions, which was not very clear um, from the bulk sequencing error. Uh, excellent. Thanks, Karichi. Uh, Jerry, anything further to add there? No, no, I think that's that's exactly right. I think that as we start doing this, um, I, I would guess if I had to um, make a generator hypothesis, which since I'm generating it will definitely be wrong, um, but I think I think probably you'll see we'll find that patients with relatively homogeneous clonal structure will sort of fall into your outlier groups. Who they'll they'll actually be relatively homogeneous and be a sensitive chemotherapy, and those will be the people you cure pretty easily. Or they'll be the, the patients who are relatively, um, you know, homogeneous but are all resistant, and so those are the people who are completely refractory to therapy. And we see, you know, 10% in AML of those. And then the bulk of the patients who respond and then relapse will be those with a little bit more complicated heterogeneity where you're getting clonal selection. And those are the type of things that we can actually start tackling once we start putting this type of technology into place. Excellent. Great. Well, thank you both for your answers there. Um, our next question, uh, and this one is for you, Dennis, uh, and it asks, um, is it possible to order a custom panel of primers against targets of interest? Uh, absolutely. That's a capability we've recently uh, launched, and you know, uh, researchers can now order up to 300 uh, different genomic loci to target um, with custom panels. And so we can, you know, genotype and very accurately call SNPs and indels across those, uh, you know, uh, those genomic loci, again, up to 300 different positions. So we, we have that capability that we offer currently. Great. Thanks, Dennis. And I think this last question is also for you, too. Uh, and this one asks, uh, working with uh, single cell uh, techniques is a bit difficult uh, because starting uh, with genomic uh, amounts is usually very low, uh, and amplica amplification bias uh, final results. Um, have you implemented any solution for this? Yeah, that is a real challenge, and, and that's something we very carefully considered when we, uh, you know, designed this workflow and, and developed it. Um, we enabled chemistry, and you know, the, the whole, the whole bioinform, or sorry, the microfluidics. Um, to very efficiently prep genomic DNA for efficient downstream DNA amplification. And through a lot of optimization, we've really, um, you know, done work to minimize technical issues like allele dropout, and we've compared our allele dropout rates to, you know, those of, of competing single cell technologies, and we, we either equal or better, um, you know, pretty much everything we've seen, uh, which gives us a very low allele dropout rate, and again, the ability to really accurately call SNPs and indels at the single cell level. Great. Thanks, Dennis. Well, I'm afraid that is all we have time for today. Uh, if you did ask a question that we didn't have time uh, to ask the speakers, uh, we'll try our best to get back to you uh, offline uh, later on. Um, before you leave us, we would really appreciate if you can spare a few seconds to fill in a very quick survey on your experience today. I would now like to thank uh, Gerald Radich, uh, Koichi Takahashi, and Dennis Eastburn for their presentations and for answering your questions. I would also like to thank the webcast sponsors, Mission Bio, and of course you, the audience, for taking the time to be with us today. Remember, you can watch this webcast again at any time on demand at nature.com webcasts. Thanks for watching, and I hope you'll join us again soon. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.